All right. Well, welcome everybody to the Disrupting Engineering Research session of Impact Engineered. Uh, my name is Jesse Austin Brenneman. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Michigan in mechanical engineering, and I'll be moderating today's session. So we'd like to welcome all of you and thank all of you for spending your precious time during these challenging uh, you know, conditions uh, here with us to discuss what the future of engineering research uh, for impact looks like. So very excited today. Um, so I'm just going to spend a few minutes uh, talking about introducing the topic, and then we'll get right to our panelists. Uh, so we're all here because of the, we want to work on engineering research, using engineering, and particularly creating new engineering knowledge through research to address the sustainable and achieve the sustainable development goals and address, uh, you know, achieve poverty reduction. And one of the important things, if we look at graphs over time, we know that poverty, as we've made a lot of progress uh, in terms of reducing poverty, but in a lot of areas, we know we still have work to do. So you can see here, um, you know, because of efforts mainly from the governments in South Asia and, and in East Asia, that's really China and India, uh, reducing a lot of their poverty, but we see in Sub-Saharan Africa, the number of people in extreme poverty is actually growing. And the projections suggest that it's going to be growing until 2030. So we have a lot of opportunity in order to find new solutions and innovations in order to try and reduce poverty. Now, one of the problems with that is that, you know, our traditional methods for doing that really focus on sort of a product level, uh, a village level. And what we are thinking about right now is how do we address this number? How do we get to the next level of poverty reduction through engineering. And we, we think that that is through multidisciplinary teams and really reaching out at a systemic level and understanding at a systemic level um, how we can address these types of issues. And so a lot of the people working in development and uh, engineering for development now, those projects don't fit into the traditional engineering research and technology transfer process. So if we really wanna understand impact, we know that the way that we have been doing it, and this is just a, you know, you don't have to look at this, this graphic too closely, but what we have here is you're going from research, you do disclosure, IP assignment, you have a commercialization plan. We all have these technology transfer offices within our university systems that are set up to get technologies that we develop in the lab out into the market. But we know that the type of engineering research that's happening today when we want to do for development to actually reduce some of these, these poverty numbers, it doesn't fit well within this. There's a lot of other things that go into it. And so uh, really the thesis for today is that the world has problems and universities have departments. Uh, I'm not sure who said that, but the earliest citation I could find of this quote was from Gary Brewer in 1999. And what we're going to look at with our panelists today is what should applied multidisciplinary research look like? What are the barriers and opportunities that we have in order to reduce these barriers to really try and achieve impact? We want those numbers to go down. How do we do that through engineering research if the traditional methods and traditional paradigms we think could use improvement? So to do that, uh, you don't wanna listen to me talk about that. That's, that's not why you're here. We have five perspectives on the future of engineering research. Alice Agagino from Berkeley, Amy Bilton from the University of Toronto, Julia Binder from EPFL, Arvin Rahman from Purdue, and Evan Thomas from CU Boulder. And what we're going to do next is we're going to have them each sort of present their organization themselves, introduce themselves and their organization um, and sort of their philosophy as to what the future of engineering research is. And then we will get to questions where you guys can submit questions. I will try and synthesize those and moderate them to the panelists. And we'll really have this roundtable discussion to try and understand where are the opportunities uh, in order for us to move engineering research forward. So with that said, enough of me talking. I'd like to turn it over to our first panelist, uh, Alice, if he, Alice Agagino. So Alice, if you could go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. Thank you again for joining us uh, and tell us about what's going on at the Blum Center. Okay, thank you, Jesse. So my name is Alice Agagino, and I'm really pleased to be here today and be among the panelists and the audience. I am a professor of mechanical engineering at UC Berkeley and also education director at the Blum Center for Developing Economies. But I'm also chair of the Development Engineering Graduate Group. 
And one of the things I want to talk about today is a bit more about the challenges and opportunities that drove its history. So, fifth, and I also want to put in the context of the Engineer 2020 reports. So I'm not moving slides yet, Jesse. 15 years ago, I was co-author of the National Academy of Engineering Consensus Studies on the Engineer 2020 and how to educate them. And our reports emphasize the needs for, as you said, a multidisciplinary systems approach that considers complex context, ethics, sustainable development, and engineering impact. And I wrote down some quotes from those studies that I think are relevant to today. We said, we aspire to a public that will recognize the union of professionalism, technical knowledge, social and historical awareness and traditions that serve to make engineers competent to address the world's complex and changing challenges. We aspire to a future where engineers are prepared to adapt to changes in global forces and trends and to ethically assist the world in creating a balance in the standard of living for developing and developed countries alike. Since then, along with ABAT transformations and curricular changes that are fairly radical across the board in, in US universities, they have tried to address the aspirations for engineers in the curricula. But it, in my mind, it has not been institutionalized at the doctoral level yet, at least it hadn't been at UC Berkeley. It was hard to follow these principles in the research agenda and apply them to the benchmarks we use for academe, like qualifying exams, dissertation reviews, and faculty promotions. So if we could go to slide two. With the encouragement from USAID, our faculty work together towards these goals to form an interdisciplinary graduate group across the campus, a new interdiscipline that we call development engineering. We collectively worked in the community to intellectually define the field and create the PhD minor. And today our graduate group, which is a kind of a self-formed department, has over 30 faculty in 18 disciplines, as you see in the word map here. So we define development engineering as a transdisciplinary field of research and practice that combines the principles of engineering with economics, entrepreneurship, design, business, and policy, among others, to create technological interventions to solve high impact problems in complex, low resource settings. In slide three, our next slide, our learning and research model is grounded in a deep understanding of the importance of context, understanding of development goals with a view to scaling in the future for impact. We use a human-centered design approach, an iterative approach to combine qualitative and quantitative data to understand the problems, make sure we're solving the right problems to start out with, and frame the problems so that they're, we're looking at the critical problems in order to create and prototype solutions for iterating on community co-design assessment and feedback for improvement using a systems approach. In the next slide, it shows our development engineering program and its context as being housed in the Blum Center for Developing Economies that provides longitudinal support for the concepts that evolve from the center with a focus on social entrepreneurship, scaling, and commercialization. And the final slide shows the development engineering program in the context of other curricular programs at the Blum Center. We build on our 10-year-old undergraduate minor in global poverty and practice. And recently based on student and industry demand, we just started, launched a new three semester professional master's degree with the first cohort starting in fall of 2021. So in summary, I asked the question, what is the future of development engineering? I believe, and I will make the point with the questions that it is the future of the engineering profession. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. Um, and we'll now move to Toronto. Uh, Amy, could you tell us what's going on over at CGen? Yeah. yeah, thanks a lot, Jesse. So I think Alice, Alice really set the, set the stage, you know, really, really well. Um, so I'm, I'm Professor Amy Bilton. I'm an Associate Professor in Mechanical Engineering at University of Toronto. And I'm also the Director of the Center for Global Engineering. Um, so I'll pop, you can forward on the slide, Jesse. Um, we were formed back in 2009, a lot with the same motivation, which, which Alice kind of mentioned previously. Um, it was really recognized that this is really the future of, of engineering. You know, there's, uh, there's a need, there's a great need for thinking about challenges in this, within the space and, and also a desire from both the faculty and student level to think about how, how we can make a contribution to think about these challenges around global development. So we were formed back in 2009, really as a cross-disciplinary research institute. And we've grown to having over 30 collaborating faculty members working on different research initiatives um, in this area. 
And our overall mission is looking at being able to catalyze, you know, cutting edge research to be able to address some of these world's um, most intractable challenges and train the next generation of engineers to make a contribution in this area. And we have a number of ways that we do that through research, our courses, um, our capstone projects, which we, which we help to develop in fellowships. So I don't have a whole lot of time today, so I'm just gonna focus on a few uh, sample uh, initiatives that we've done as a, as a framework that we look at applying towards uh, addressing research and bringing together these type of multidisciplinary teams to work in this area. So you can go on to the next slide, Jesse. So, um, so a few of the project, a few of the multi uh, multi-faculty um, initiatives that we've been uh, coordinating out of the center are, are um, really, uh, really focused on particular challenges. So the first, the, first, uh, the first of these types of initiatives I'm gonna highlight is an initiative called the Reconciliation Through Engineering Initiative. So this is recognizing the fact that there are a lot of um, sustainability challenges which are being encountered by remote indigenous communities within Canada. And there was a desire uh, about three years ago to think about how engineering could play a role and collaborate together with different faculty members from across the university to contribute. Uh, so we came together and put together this initiative and it was recognized uh, that doing this work is something that's gonna be a long-term initiative and we needed to make sure that we had, uh, you know, a very systematic and, and uh, approach to be able to go through it. So we started really from the ground up, uh, you know, brought on, brought on some, uh, some uh, research associates to really ground the project and help develop the concepts, develop the relationships with the, with the communities and, and develop the approach. Um, and we developed an approach that's really based on uh, two-eyed seeing. So uh, thinking about bringing indigenous knowledge into the process itself and uh, making sure that it is really indigenous uh, focused uh, challenges, which, which they want to see having addressed. So um, we, in the course of the, of the three years we've been working on this, we brought together a number of different projects uh, focused on this. And I think um, from things related to uh, food security, uh, access to clean water, uh, access to um, uh, slope supply chain and logistics, which is really difficult for many of these remote indigenous communities and seeing how engineering research can play a role. Uh, and uh, I, I don't have a whole lot of time to go into the exact details, but I think one of the key things that we found is really essential when thinking about these types of research projects is to try to think about what are the barriers uh, from both the faculty and the community level from engaging and being able to put an together an infrastructure to address that. Uh, and that's really the goal of what we're doing in the center and through our research associates, being able to make that bridge and make that connection. So the, we'll go on to the next one. Uh, yeah, so another, another initiative, which is a little, bit, a little bit newer that we've been working on, again, is a, is a program. This is focused on sustainable prairie urbanization uh, and thinking about the rapid expansion that is happening in me mega cities around the world. Again, you know, we followed this, this same approach towards putting together this multi-faculty collaborative research, uh, research initiative. Uh, we have some, some research associates which are really grounding the research, providing the connections and, and the direct connections with, the, with our partners and uh, making sure that the research is gonna be stay, stay relevant and making sure that it's really community focused and, and the right problems to be addressed. So I think um, one of the big things that we've been doing is yeah, just trying to put together that ecosystem that enable uh, faculty to contribute in this area where the type of research is really, um, really challenging to get, get up and running, takes a lot more than a lot of the more traditional research, research activities. And, and CGM, we're really trying to put together an infrastructure that enable faculty to contribute and make sure that the research stays relevant. And um, we'll just go on to the last, last slide. One of the other key things that we do when we're developing these partnerships is we find sometimes there's a role for engineering research to play. Sometimes there's a role for engineering to play that's not necessarily research. Um, and there's a lot of need from some of our partners to think about how we can, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the more technical challenges that they're addressing, they just don't have the bandwidth to think about. So one of the things that we've been doing also within CGEN is partnering up some of the things that we've been doing with our partners with more well-defined engineering um, projects that, that, um, that really address their challenges. So one of the other key things that we've been doing to help support that is looking at how we can leverage and, uh, and you know, and, and educate 
uh, the future leaders in this area in these initiatives. So we have we form these range of capstone projects where the students get a chance to uh, collaborate together with the NGOs. They get a chance to work together with them in the field and address their challenges. And these are things that help to help to um, help to solidify some of the relationships that we're building. Uh, and, and help to address some of the real challenges seen by the NGOs in, in, a, in a relatively short time frame. So that's just a few things that we've been doing to help support these types of, uh, the formation of these types of projects and, and, uh, and hope to seed, hope these, these topics will seed some of the discussion as we, as we think about how we can further catalyze engineering research to make an impact in this area um, as we go through the discussion. So I'll pass it along to the next, the next uh, panelist. Yes, thanks, Amy. Um, and now we're going to go to Switzerland to EPFL and Julia Binder. Julia, can you tell us what's going on uh, with Tech for Impact? Thank you so much, Jesse. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I, actually, good evening from, from Switzerland, Lausanne, from my, my side. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, what I want to tell you a little bit about today is um, we have a new initiative at EPFL Rada New since end of 2017, where we want to address university-wide the problem of, of how can we generate as a tech university, how can we have an impact. And if you look at the slide, I think uh, I, I always like to start with the slide because in many ways we know that uh, climate change is real. We know that uh, all the scientific facts show us global warming is happening. And at the same time, we have more and more leaders in powerful positions. And I don't have to tell you that in the US that that basically contribute to the distrust in this data. And I think as a, as a university, this is something that we should be fundamentally concerned about. Um, and we wanted to address this with, a, with an initiative that is really holistic in the sense that um, we truly believe in what Amy and Alice mentioned, this multidisciplinary approach also from our faculty, but we will also want to take this outside. How can we make our knowledge better accessible and disseminate that to the general public, to companies, um, to NGOs, to international organizations, to uh, basically really have an impact um, beyond our immediate uh, university setting. If you can go to the next slide. Jesse, thank you so much. Uh, and basically what we're doing is on the one hand, we're promoting this multidisciplinary um, research, uh, sustainable research. How can our research address the sustainable development goals? And I think in many ways, as a tech university, we often still have to do some, um, some pioneering work, right? We still have to, um, have to enlighten our researchers that actually their research is linked to the sustainable development goals or can have an impact beyond their lab. What we also do, and I just mentioned that, we really try to get the corporates on board. Um, how can we actually um, create innovation projects together with big companies, together with NGOs and international organizations? We're in Lausanne. Uh, Geneva is just like 30 minutes down the road. So for us, all the big organizations basically are just um, like 30 minutes down the road, which means how can we better collaborate on addressing these very important issues of our time? And then last point is, um, how can we sensitize our researchers and students for, uh, for this uh, whole notion of becoming entrepreneurs and what is more becoming entrepreneurs with an impact? Yes, next slide, Jesse. Thank you. <clears throat> we did a mapping of our, um, of our EPFL campus and what we found, and I think this is very interesting, out of our 350 labs, what we find is that 190 work on at least one of the SDGs, which I think is already quite remarkable. Um, we had to do some work where we were basically explaining what are the SDGs, uh, what are we even talking about. Um, but basically what we really find is that um, EPFL is particularly strong when it comes to contributing to health impact, contributing to um, energy, renewable energies, and this bigger bucket of uh, industry innovation and infrastructure. And we see this reflected in our spin-offs and we see this reflected in our uh, dedicated research centers. Next slide. What, what for us is really at, at the heart of the in, entire initiative is this um, collaborative multi-stakeholder approach where we have formed se um, several councils. They, they look like they're organized in silos and, and let me uh, reassure you, it's not the case. It's just for us to organize them in a way. Um, on the one hand, we have the academic council, we have our NGO council, we have a corporate council and we have our entrepreneurship community. And while all of them have a dedicated, let's say um, program manager that tries to understand their needs um, and then tries to, to work with them on a daily basis, the core idea is always to initiate projects where they have to collaborate. Um, and I give you just a, a couple of examples. One example is our data-driven circular economy initiative, where we really work um, with, uh, I, at the moment, I think we have 25 of our researchers involved um, from all faculties or, or three out of our uh, six faculties. Uh, and then basically what we can really see is that, um, that EPFL could play a strong role in kind of bringing this data 
um, data perspective um, to this whole notion of circular economy. Because I think in many ways, we know that circular economy might be a very promising solution. And the question is, why haven't it uh, lived up to its potential just yet? And uh, we, we say we can actually basically uh, add a missing puzzle piece to this conversation. Another project that is dear to my heart is basically our Tech for Deaf initiative. And here, um, and also mirroring what Alice was mentioning, we really uh, adopt a human-centered uh, design approach where we work together with our NGOs and basically our NGOs submit challenges that they have encountered on the field and they submit these challenges to us and then our researchers can um, can basically answer with a concrete proposal of how their technology, how their technological solution can address um, this challenge that the NGO has encountered. And then, and this is uh, basically putting another um, uh, for us a challenge, but it's quite interesting, is they have to work with partners in the global south. This could be universities, entrepreneurs, um, this could be policymakers. They have to work with partners in the global south in implementing the solution on site and in building um, scalable and sustainable business models. So this is really the idea that we try to, how can we leverage EPFL technologies to address the grand societal challenges of our time? And I truly believe that this is the future of, of impact engineering if we talk about it. And I think we try really to approach uh, change as a chance for our, and as an opportunity. And uh, we hope, uh, and, and it's actually very nice to be with many like-minded speakers and, and um, for sure audience as well. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Uh, really great. Um, and then Arvind, uh, can you tell us what's happening at Purdue? Yeah, hi. Uh, good day, everyone. My name is uh, Arvind Raman. Um, I'm a professor of mechanical engineering, so really glad this event is happening in ASME. Um, I uh, am currently the executive associate dean for the faculty and staff of the college uh, and also the director of uh, the USAID funded uh, Laser Pulse Consortium, which is really a five year effort um, to really bring research driven solutions uh, to bear to field source uh, development uh, challenges. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, associate dean for global programs and had a chance to work on um, what used to be the Innovation for International Development Lab or Innovation Lab, which is today the Shah family uh, global innovation lab. Uh, next slide. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to broadly uh, think about uh, science, technology, and innovation playing uh, probably a key role um, in the future of development. You know, uh, as some of you know, the future of uh, you know development and um, SDG goals have been really set back by the COVID uh, crisis as well, at least by five, some some say ten years. Uh, so the 2030 objective is going to get harder. Uh, still, you know, I'm a strong believer in science, technology, and innovation playing a key role in it. Um, I, I always like to refer to <clears throat> the different ways or think about the different ways in which STI, which I think of as engineering, really uh, can play a role. Uh, and this is articulated very well by the two objectives of what is today the uh, Innovation Technology and Research Hub at USAID, um, and uh, which used to be Global Development Lab. But it speaks about two objectives. One is this notion of producing breakthrough innovations by sourcing, testing, and scaling. Uh, which is what we've been talking about uh, so far. But there's another angle to this, which is really about how do we transform the development enterprise, uh, you know, promoting different partnerships, data, evidence, harnessing all kinds of scientific advances. Uh, and so I'll try to give examples of two examples of what we've been trying to do at Purdue in each of these contexts. Next slide. Uh, so just like uh, in uh, other institutions here, uh, we started uh, within uh, Global Engineering Programs 2014, uh, the Innovation for International Development Lab, which thanks to our donor who's featured uh, in the middle, uh, Manu Enrique Shah, uh, is now uh, uh, really uh, active and diverse, uh, you know, enthusiastic group of people working on uh, uh, these kind of challenges. Um, I have here uh, uh, Pallavi Gupta. She's the program director. She's on the on the on the, on the, on the right here. Um, George Chu, who is our assistant dean for global programs, all listed. Uh, next slide, please. I want to emphasize here our model, which actually is not uh, you know very uh, different from what Yulia just uh, spoke about. Uh, we regard the top NGOs in the world as uh, being representative of the development sector. These are the the people who actually uh, have long-standing expertise in working with communities and so on. We've developed long-standing partnerships with many top NGOs, and we have a really intense focus effort at trying to understand what are field source development challenges. We have our own pathways to uh, unpeeling that in many cases. In most cases, for example, uh, 
there is actually not a need for a new technological innovation. It's a last mile challenge. The technology exists at the right cost. It's not, not there at the community for whatever reason. So it's really, it takes a lot of feeling to figure out uh, what the innovation gap really is. And then we present it as uh, challenge problems, um, you know, research partnerships and so on. We have a particular focus on scale up, uh, not only through um, uh, startups, but also through um, uh, other kinds of partnerships for scaling up. So this is one of our loop focusing on NGO partnerships, uh, seeding programs, and getting to really to um, the scale up of uh, those efforts. Next slide. Uh, the other example, which was the other part of the objectives of science, technology, innovation, is how can we change the development enterprise as a whole? Uh, the international development enterprise, which is driven by you know all the fund donors, international donors, that's roughly a fifty to seventy billion dollar enterprise, not including the national governments uh, all over the place. Uh, all that those tens of billions of dollars of international development programming are going into implement program implementation. And there is a real opportunity for research, especially science, technology, and innovation, to inform those massive implementation uh, projects that are going on around the world. And that's what LASER tries to do is really engage worldwide uh, more than 2,000 uh, researchers, practitioners in all 56 USAID uh, countries, and really engaging them with these uh, field source development challenges where research can really play a key role. Um, so these are some of the numbers. We are a consortium, like I said, Purdue, CRS, Indiana University, Makerere University in Uganda, Notre Dame. My colleagues uh, who are doing all this uh, with me, Yuan Yi, she's a faculty in industrial engineering, Joe Sinfield, who's our innovation science lead in civil engineering, uh, and then Andrea Berniski and Betty Bugus are program uh, directors uh, for this. Uh, next slide. To give you a quick idea of what this comprises of, we have many parts. We have this massive network, like I said. Uh, we, we pay a lot of effort in working with uh, development stakeholders to identify key research challenges. Um, we fund them through uh, core and buy-in mechanisms. We have this whole model for embedded research translation to make sure research translates into changing policy or practice. Uh, and uh, we ensure gender integration uh, in everything that's done. And we focus on capacity strengthening our researchers to be able to more effectively translate the research to policy and practice. Next slide. Uh, we, we do this process, uh, all these different things using innovation science to identify what the research gaps are for development uh, in more traditional sectors, such as water, food, security, education, East Africa, but also in more current areas, such as the Venezuelan migration response in Colombia, uh, such as themes of water and air pollution in Vietnam, private sector competitiveness, uh, measurement of resilience, for example, in, in Ethiopia. We work with the local missions, really, uh, and larger set of stakeholders to identify these things. And we issue grant calls and fund researchers to ensure they work with translation partners to translate what they do uh, to policy or practice. Over. Next slide. An example of some of the buy-in projects to give you an idea of how impactful they are. Um, you know, one is in northern Iraq, where uh, post ISIS, uh, ISIS had a dedicated strategy, for example, of uh, not only uh, uh, intentionally wiping out uh, agriculture that was related to cultural practices of the religious minorities. Uh, so we work really with our uh, agriculture uh, program, as well as in Notre Dame uh, anthropology experts, to really figure out what were to do research on identifying what what needs to be done with cultural agriculture to restore these communities and bring them back. Uh, we're working with South Africa. It's a very unique partnership with the Department of Science and Innovation uh, in South Africa and USAID mission uh, to help South Africa's efforts to really improve the situation with uh, trafficking in uh, persons. Uh, we're funding through the, uh, si the uh, Science Academy of uh, African Science Academy. Uh, we're funding research, uh, trying to bring out through data and through rigorous research, uh, the scale and scope of uh, human trafficking that exists in South Africa today. Uh, so these are some examples of what we're trying to do through laser. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you, Arvin. Uh, Evan, I think. Great. Yeah, thanks. So uh, my name is Evan Thomas. I'm Associate Professor of Engineering at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And I'm the director of the Mortensen Center in Global Engineering. The Mortensen Center was founded in 2004 as the Mortensen Center in Engineering for Developing Communities. and over the past almost 16 years, we've evolved into a multidisciplinary research and academic center that embraces a lot of the uh, updating of how engineers contribute to global poverty reduction that 
Alice and Arvind and the other presenters have shown today. So I think we see a lot of alignments as this field of engineering, global engineering, development engineering, humanitarian engineering advances. A little bit of context setting again to build on what Jesse said earlier. Here's who uses energy and here's who's contributing to global warming. And here's who still has a high burden of disease. 99% of the children under the age of five who die every year were born in a low income country. So there's still significant health and economic and uh, justice disparities globally. One of the challenges is the mechanisms of how we deliver foreign aid. Often money comes in from one side, all this programming that Arvin mentioned, into projects that often have a technology component, water filters, off-grid energy systems, cook stoves, sanitation systems, designed to benefit people's health and livelihoods. But the outcome of that development programming can be short-lived. About half of water and sanitation programs uh, or infrastructure is broken or in disrepair within the first 18 months, but we don't pay for services. We hope that communities and countries can sustain services, but these are communities that have very low tax bases and are already constrained by other poverty barriers and have difficulty supporting a service. So part of our vision of global engineering is how do we get engineers to think beyond a project, beyond a product, and think about services. So if you have a water pump, you monitor that water pump, you create a maintenance mechanism, and you incentivize the money and the business model have to come into play so you can incentivize cost-effective service delivery. We do this within the Mortensen Center at a number of different levels. The Mortensen Center has about 200 undergrads in our program, many of whom are earning our global engineering minor. We have 70 graduate students in our program who are earning either our graduate certificate in global engineering or our professional masters in global engineering. And our students and faculty work in about 20 countries around the world. We're a medium sized research center. We do about $5 million a year in uh, research and contracts from USAID and NSF and a number of the other uh, partners that have been mentioned today. We changed our name from engineering for developing communities to global engineering about two years ago to really uh, own that we're work, trying to work on a higher level than just the symptoms of poverty. We also want to be concerned with the causes and potential solutions to persistent poverty. So that includes looking at standards development, system science, impact evaluation, data, instrumentation, contracting, uh, which is an important piece of how we sustain services. Structures and settlements, of course, the core has often been environmental health, air quality and water quality and safe sanitation, and then professional, graduate and undergraduate education. Because ASME and uh, some of the work that Engineering for Change has done over the years is particularly mechanical engineering focused, I wanted to highlight some of our thoughts around product design. I'm not going to narrate this slide, but the takeaway is that there's been a lot of emphasis on human-centered design and similar models in the development space. We're working to incorporate service delivery as part of design in development and trying to support service providers. And that design goes beyond a product. So I'm gonna give just a couple quick examples of our current research. This is a project led by one of our outstanding PhD students, Chantal Irabagiza. Uh, Chantal has been funded by the NIH and the Gates Foundation to develop this air quality monitoring technology that shows people in households in Rwanda their current air quality. And we use this to try to encourage healthy behavior change. And I've just put a couple example articles just to show sort of the breadth of where you can publish in this field. So this is an article in the Journal of Exposure Science and Ep Environmental Epidemiology, not usually a journal for an environmental engineering PhD student. Another example of our work is focused on how do we improve the sustainability of rural water services. And we do this in part with instrumentation where we have satellite connected sensors on hand pumps and deep boreholes. And when these sensors tell us that a pump is broken, we go out and fix it. Chantal led some of this effort in Rwanda a number of years ago. This has been funded by NSF, USAID, DFID, and the World Bank. We're currently in the middle of a large scale deployment with the World Bank in Nigeria. Uh, today, we ordinarily would have been over there, but we're doing it all remotely with our partners, WaterAid Nigeria. And we, we publish in fields, you know, in journals as diverse as ESNT and PLOS One on topics that include controlled trials as well as things like machine learning. 
we're not doing this at scale. This is Northern Kenya where drought is effectively an annual occurrence now. And when there's drought, people turn to groundwater boreholes. These are no longer hand pumps. These are big uh, groundwater systems. And yet often about, about 60% of them are broken during peak drought. So our goal is to try to reduce drought emergency through better maintenance of this infrastructure. The way we do this is a combination of in situ sensors on these pumps combined with remote sensing from satellites to try to improve preventative and proactive maintenance. Some of this work is led by another one of our PhD students, Dennis Machara. Dennis is actually based in Nairobi. He works full time for the Regional Center of Mapping for Resources for Development and is remotely a PhD student with us in Boulder while actually in the context in Kenya. This is our current monitoring. We have about 3 million people's water supplies that we're monitoring on a daily basis. So we've covered Northern and Eastern Ethiopia and Northern Kenya. And in combination, we're monitoring 3 million people's water supplies daily. This work is funded by USAID, NASA, and the National Science Foundation. Another one of our major projects is USAID Sustainable Watch Systems. As Alice mentioned, all of this work elevates the question to systems level thinking for engineers. SWS is a $15.3 million five-year cooperative agreement led by uh, Amy javernick will and Carl Linden here at UC Boulder and funded by USAID over the past five years, trying to look at the actual drivers and determinants of sustaining basic water and sanitation services. Outside of the wash sector, we also work on infrastructure. This is a pedestrian footbridge installed by the NGO Bridges to Prosperity. We've been contracted by USAID uh, out of the Development Innovation Ventures Program actually that came out of the Global Development Lab to run a five-year impact evaluation of the health, economic, and educational benefits attributable to these footbridges. So it's a 200 site, five-year randomized control trial that also includes other innovations like cameras next to the bridges to track use, remote sensing to look at rainfall and flooding events to try and model and estimate the full impact of the bridges beyond just the data collected from the RCT. So it's mixed methods between randomized control trials and other monitoring tools. All right, back over to you, Jesse. Uh, all right, thank you very much, uh, Evan, uh, for that overview of the Morton Center over at Colorado Boulder. Um, and thank you all the panelists for sharing some of your insights and experiences. So there's been a lot of great questions in the, in the Q&A. And uh, I wanna thank all panelists for, for writing out in the chat some of the answers to those. Um, I think I'd like to start our discussion by by getting into one of the one of the Q and A questions asked. How do you deal with IP and protecting IP if you're going to be working with outside partners? So the traditional process of protecting intellectual property in a technology transfer situation. How does that work in a situation like this, where a lot of the same structures may not apply? And and Julia, you. You shared a, a thing about social IP and, and a new model for doing that. I was wondering if you could talk about maybe some of the other innovations that you guys have had in developing sort of multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder collaborations. Of course, thank you so much, Jesse. And uh, I think to, to quickly just uh, um, recap the, the answer was, we were trying to really develop a, a licensing model that would at the same time um, allow to protect the technology because I, do believe that this is important. I think in many ways, we often think that to make something applicable and, and scale it um, in particular to global South countries, we need to have it um, as an open uh, licensing model. And I don't believe that this is the case because in many ways, uh, if we want to get our technologies financed, if we want to get VCs on board, if we want to really um, scale this technology and have an impact, we often need to have some kind of protection on this as well. Uh, and I think that the way that we're trying to address this is with the social licensing model so that it's actually made affordable for those who really want to have an impact with the technology, but that those who, who don't have the strong impact dimension, they do have to pay a fair share. And uh, I think in, um, to, to answer your, your other question, what are other um, innovative models? I was trying to, to touch upon a little bit on these multi-stakeholder approaches that we're trying to establish. And the idea really is how can we get um, different players around the table. And I think the fundamental challenge here is that 
how do you translate from someone um, who is, uh, has a corporate mindset, uh, someone who has an NGO background, someone who has a researcher background, and I'm not talking about English, right? We're talking fundamentally different languages here. Uh, English is, is maybe the common denominator, um, and the rest is something that where we need to work quite hard. And this is where I think um, what works well for us is we, we bring them together, we, we have full day workshops, we, um, we organize this in a way where we um, train our researchers to, um, to re present their, res their research in a way that is um, digestible for a non-expert audience. Um, and basically, we really try to, uh, to identify these uh, uncommon ways, like the Tech for Death pro project that I mentioned, where we bring together um, NGO partners with researchers, with entrepreneurs in the global south. And actually, all of this is financed by, um, by a policy, uh, by a political partner. And basically, I think this is the way where, where we really believe if we are able to break down silos. And I think we've heard it several times from the other panelists, um, this whole system thinking approach. How can we actually change the system instead of just doing business as usual and, and changing some small interventions. How can we really get other players on board and, and, and uh, open up our research and make it accessible? And I think this is still something where we tend to work a little bit in our own world as researchers. Um, how can we make uh, and disseminate our knowledge in a way um, that is meaningful and valuable and can be, um, can be really used by, by the general public, including corporates, NGOs, and other important players? Oh, thank you, Julia. Um, I was wondering if one of the other panelists uh, had another in interesting mechanism uh, by which to try and catalyze some of these multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder where we're dealing with, uh, you know, NGOs, we're also dealing with governmental agencies, we're dealing with outside organizations. Um, so maybe someone would like to go uh, and, and take the ball or I can pass it. Uh, I think maybe Arvind, you could talk, discuss discuss some of that. Yeah, no, thank you. I think uh, it's been interesting, uh, and I you know, look forward to actually sharing notes also with Yulia, uh, you know, regarding their experience at EPFL. But um, the NGO partnerships has been very revealing and interesting to us. It's a, um, it's actually a, a process by which our NGO partners submit reach challenges, and we kind of work through with them on what they might, you know, kind of um, unfeeling uh, things and unpacking uh, the details of those things. Um, so that's really interesting. Uh, you know, I just wanted to bring one, you know, as you think of these NGO partnerships, uh, faculty tend to, at universities tend to think of it more as research and research for impact opportunities. Actually the potential for partnering with NGOs uh, is much broader than just that. And I just want to highlight these things as people think of longer term NGO partnerships. Um, getting into these things, I think it's very important to lay down what the value propositions of each side are, the bigger picture value propositions, everyone's working towards with common expectations on what needs to be done. Uh, the co-creation side of things, coming up with what are the real challenges, oftentimes you have, oh, I need this, and then you go back and work it back, and it's really, is it really what is needed or something else, or is it really, is it a last mile problem that the solution already exists? It's for other reasons, it's not there. A third piece, I think, um, that needs to happen uh, beyond this research uh, partnerships piece is uh, there are really good opportunities for um, uh, education, training, and certification. Um, you know, how can uh, universities, for example, offer certifications? You know, maybe data science for development degrees for for the for the development sector. Uh, we also need to think of more about how how can more engineers get into the NGO world and choose careers in the NGO world, right? So how do you make that whole interface, internship programs? Many NGOs actually have internship programs trying to get uh, engineers in on them. There are ways to articulate this and make it much stronger because the enterprise, the, the sector, development sector itself needs more STEM professionals working in them. Uh, you know, that's another way to drive the change, not just through research and innovation in our universities. And, you know, so that's something else to think about. Uh, so, uh, broader partnerships with NGOs, value proposition, broader partnerships uh, is, is, I think, the way to go. Over. Thank you, Arvind. That's a, that's a really great point. Um, I'd like to maybe, uh, Alice, go ahead. I just wanted to add, one, I just want to add one other concept here. In addition to the licensing and the patenting, which often is to protect the quality of the technology and make it and make it more accessible is authoring papers together with communities. So if you're doing co-design working with major players in a co-design process, they should be co-authors of any publications that come out of it. That's a, that's a great follow-up point and something I think that, you know, we are working to in the ASME research committee to try and get people to, you know, have that be a norm for our research community 
to really be, you know, crediting everybody equally for their contributions to research work. Um, I'd like to maybe switch the, the, the focus from going to different types of organizations and multiple stakeholder organizations to the multiple disciplines that people have been talking about. We've said interdisciplinary, we've said transdisciplinary, we've said multidisciplinary. I was wondering maybe if Amy, uh, if you could talk a little bit about what it's been like just within the academic space, like even in the same organization, trying what are some of the catalysts to get people to the table and get buy-in or what are some of the mechanisms you use to really build these teams that have people speak different engineering languages yeah like i think i think um i think there's a lot of interest from faculty and just in general in terms of engaging on these types of problems i think part of the challenges that we see is that you know, if they if they haven't engaged in this type of topic before, it's they see it as a big a big hill a big hill to climb. Like they have a lot of interest in being able to do research that has this type of broad impact that we're talking about. But if they if they haven't done that work before, it's 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 they they need some other kind of little uh, hook to help them engage. Um, and that's really one of the main things that we try to do within the center is to be able to like. Uh, try to lower that barrier a little bit so they can get engaged and, and work together with people who have the expertise, you know, working in the field to make it so they can make sure the research is relevant. Um, and then they can bring, you know, bring the right people together at the to the table. So I think in general, there's a lot of interest. What we've done in our approach is, yeah, we try to bring on people that work within the center that, that can, can, can make that happen. And that's how I think that's how we've gotten up to, you know, 30 plus kind of faculty working and engaging on these projects. So it's by getting those research associates that are able to, you know, that know the language of the know the language of the communities. Uh, they understand the academic language and what some of the demands of the faculty members' time are. So trying to make it so we can make that make that bridge because this type of research is something that um, there's a lot more questions at play than than a typical engineering research project where you just have to go to the you know go to the lab and, and tinker on your on your different you know device. So what we really try to do in the center is try to make sure that we have access to um, expertise that can kind of make that make that bridge and, and make make the projects happen. And without it, I think it would be really difficult for a lot of the things that we're that we're doing. Well, thank you, Amy. I think that's a, that's a really great point about thinking about where again, what is the value proposition, as Arvin mentioned, but also lowering that barrier so that people don't see it as too big a hill, so they can really engage, giving them a way to engage. Um, I'd like to ask one last question because we're almost out of time here, and I again want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, Alice, could you, uh, I think Alice and Arvin maybe, could you guys talk about, you know, thinking about this academic career path where you go from graduate student to assistant professor, associate professor, full professor, um, how, how does that play into this need, you know, all of those evaluations at each of those points, you talked about qualifying exams, we talked about promotion and tenure, at all of those points that sort of is looking towards the traditional checkboxes. Right, the traditional ways of assessing uh, candidates and, and, and people. Could you talk about some of the mechanisms you guys are looking at in order to try and change that to reflect this change that you guys believe is fundamental to, to the future of engineering? Well, we, we try to make the argument that what we're doing is developing students who have 21st century skills. And those are the skills that will be effective whether you're working with a multinational or a nonprofit or in an academic setting. So a lot of those multidiscipline or these skills come from the early ABET 2000 work, but they have broader and deeper meaning, I think, within the development context. For instance, multidisciplinary design and teamwork means uh, is important, but it means more than just computer scientists working with mechanical engineers. It can mean working with community and, and having the humility to appreciate the indigenous knowledge of the community that you're working with. Ethics takes on different meanings. I mean, there's the ethics of does it work? Will it not hurt people? But there's the ethics of how you work with other people as well. And practical ethics of do you take a bribe because you only have two days in the field and they're gonna put you in jail unless you give you the bribe. Uh, design of experiments is a skill that we all teach in all of our courses. But when we work on human-centered design, that means integrating qualitative and quantitative data as well and designing experiments with people. And so I think all of these put together with co-design, self-reflection and business model 
really means that engineers that, that work on these problems have much broader skills that are going to be useful for a wide range of companies and translation to practice. Thank you, Alice. Arvind, do you have any last thoughts uh, you want you know, to add on? Yeah, I just, uh, you know, uh, to, to, your, to your point, I'd like to say that, um, uh, you know, I'm not going to just uh, paper over the fact that there are challenges, right, for faculty members to, to continue to uh, grow within an environment which looks more uh, at traditional beans, bean counting uh, measures. Um, but having said that, uh, there are two things I'd like to say. You know, most most uh, most uh, schools and colleges, uh, people really resonate with the notion of impact. Uh, you know, everyone is busy uh, with things, but you know, if you can, in your promotion documents, uh, you know, not just describe how busy you've been, but what difference it's made. Uh, I think it's resonating a lot more uh, anymore. So, in fact, any major recognition or award, uh, you know, people are not going to be looking at how many things you've done. People are going to be looking at what difference did it make. And so, um, I think the longer play of it is it's always been the case uh, in academia that impact. And I do think that in development uh, and for engineers working in development faculty, uh, they do need to put in a little more time to make sure the impact really happens. Uh, I mean, it's, it's even more contingent upon us. You know, in a normal research area, you could publish and just be happy with the disciplinary impact. But in development engineering, I think it is the onus is really upon us to make sure that it actually translates. And once it does, uh, I think the message will be loud and clear, and uh, most universities uh, recognize impact uh, and reward it as well. Over. Well, thank you very much, Arvind. I think that's an, an excellent point and something for us all to think about. I'd like to thank all of our panelists and all of our attendees. I think we are at time. I do want to share one last slide to encourage you to all come to our E4C seminar series. Uh, it's a monthly series that started back in January of 2020. In December, uh, usually it's the second Wednesday of every month at 12 uh, at noon Eastern Standard Time. But uh, because we're having presenters from Australia, one time only it's going to be at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, so I apologize for people in Europe that, that might be too late. Uh, but uh, please come. We're going to be talking about teaching humanitarian engineering from the Australian uh, presenters. Uh, and look for that seminar series on the Engineering for Change website through ASME. Um, again, just thank you so much for all the panelists sharing your insights. Uh, I'm going to try and incorporate them into my work, and that's why I wanted to have all of you guys here speaking so I could learn. I hope that our attendees learned a lot. Um, thank you all for our, your, your precious time over, over this challenging situation. I hope you guys all stay safe, and I look forward to speaking with you and thinking about these issues for the future of engineering research uh, in the future. So thanks again, uh, and everyone stay safe and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Jesse. Thank you, everyone.